good for me, honestly. Like, such a good reading month. Oh my goodness, I'm already falling apart at the thought of having to talk about this book. Selfish and misogynistic and just horrible. <laughs> so cute. Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ishi, and today I will tell you about all of the books I read during the month of October. It's been a long time since I've been able to film when it's still daylight outside, so I'm honestly really happy for me. It's the little things in life, you know? Like being able to film when it's daylight. I'm also wearing my Howl's Moving Castle earrings, which I'm also really happy about. Wearing these earrings honestly makes me feel so magical, so good for me. <laughs> There's also a bunch of kids playing outside like right next to my window. So if you hear any chaotic sounds from my end, it's them. Honestly, I wonder what they think when they see me because they can see me. My window is open. <laughs> anyway, I read 19 books in October. 19. And I'm so happy. This has been my best reading month ever. I think the most I've ever read is like 16. So... Honestly, this is amazing. So happy for me. 10 of those books I read for a vlog where I reread books from my favorite childhood authors. I'm not really gonna talk about those books here because I already talked about them in that vlog. For the other nine that I will be talking about, I have rated them from the ones I like the most to the ones I like the least. So I will be starting off with books that I love the most and then making my way down to this one really disappointing book. The first book I'll talk about is one that I'm actually really excited to tell you all about, Honeycomb by Joanne M. Harris. I loved this book so, so much. Five out of five stars. It's honestly one of my most favorite books that I've read this year, and it might even be like a favorite favorite, like a lifetime favorite, but I'll have to think about that more. But I honestly really, really love this book and I highly recommend you guys check it out. This book is like a collection of short fairy tales, but not really fairy tales that we are familiar with. But I think the author made up these fairy tales. They are inspired by fairy tales that we know, but they're so much more magical, so much more whimsical and so beautiful. I don't really know how to fully explain them, so I'm just going to read you this little, I don't know, summary type thing, I guess. Basically, this book is described as eerie, dark, and opulent, cocooned in silk and shadows. This is a novel unlike any other, a honeycomb built from a hundred cells, each cell a story in its own right. It follows the tale of the Lacewing King, who is the ruler of the Silken Folk, his misadventures, his treacheries, and his pursuit through many worlds by both the vengeful Spider Queen and the deadly Harlequin. All the characters in all of the short stories are so magical and I loved reading about them and it's just so fascinating. I cannot even explain to you. You just have to read it for yourself. And even though we are reading these different stories about different people, they are all interconnected and at the end we get to see the full picture of how everyone is connected. It's so good. I usually am not a big fan of short story collections and fairy tale collections and things like that, but I loved this book so much. You can expect to see this on the list of books I love the most in 2021. My second favorite book of this month is Rebecca. I was not expecting this book to be as beautiful as it was and I I was not expecting to love it as much as I did, but I love this book, five out of five stars. I also read this for a vlog where I read all of Connor's favorite books. I'll link that down below so you can check that out because I feel like I talked more about this book in that vlog than I probably will here. This book follows a main character, obviously, but we never really know her name. We just know her as Mrs. De Winter after she gets married to Mr. De Winter. She meets this man by the name of Maxim De Winter in the south of France at this hotel and she falls in love with him. They hang out for a couple weeks and then they decide to get married and they move in together into his home called Manderley. Basically, Maxim used to be married to this woman named Rebecca and she died but it feels like she's never truly gone and even though Rebecca is dead, her presence in this book is very prominent. Our main character feels like she can never truly live up to Rebecca. Everyone she meets compares her to Rebecca and even some of the people who work at Manderley 
feel like Rebecca was a better mistress of the house and that our main character will never truly live up to that. The writing is just so beautiful, the imagery is so vivid. I loved this main character and I loved reading through her point of view. One of the biggest troubles I have with classics is that I can never truly understand the main character. I feel very separate from the main character, but this is one of the first main characters in a classic novel that I truly felt like I could understand. Her inner monologue was honestly one of the most entertaining things at times and I loved it. There's also a movie based on this book that I watched after I read it. The movie was lovely, but I don't think it quite lives up to what this book is. This book is so much better and just so amazing. This is definitely a book that I think I might reread several times in the future. The next book, which is also a five-star read, is You Deserve Each Other by Sarah Hoggle. This book was so cute. <laughs> I honestly just could not... I couldn't take it, it was so cute. We follow Naomi and her fiance Nicholas and they are in the middle of planning their wedding. But basically, Naomi's to-be mother-in-law, Nicholas's mother, just has kind of taken over wedding preparations and won't let Naomi have a single say in her own wedding. And because of all the stress surrounding their wedding, Naomi feels like she has fallen out of love with Nicholas. So basically, she sets off to try and sabotage the engagement. She is trying to get Nicholas to break up with her and call off the wedding because she doesn't want to be the one to do it. But in this process of trying to sabotage each other, they fall more in love than they were in before. So I'm just... <laughs> so cute. Sometimes both Naomi and Nicholas were so frustrating in this book, like... I was reading it and I was like, just communicate, communicate. But other times they were so petty that it was just so funny. And sometimes they were so cute and I just could not help but root for them throughout this book. I have not read that many like romance, contemporary romance books this year. I think this is maybe like the third one, but I think this is my favorite one that I've read so far and I loved it so much. I highly recommend it. You should read it, even if you do not like contemporary romance because I also don't like it that much. It's not my favorite genre, but this book just was so good. This book honestly had some of the funniest scenes I have ever come across. I listened to this on audiobook and I was in public trying not to cackle because it's just so funny. I, <laughs> I loved it so much. Honestly, like it's such a feel good book. I highly recommend. The next book is also a five star read. I also loved it so much. I think that all of the books or most of the books that I will talk about in this wrap up are books that might end up in my favorites of 2021 list. So good for me, honestly, like such a good reading month. Anyway, Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. I went into this not knowing what to expect and not really knowing what this book was about. A friend recommended it to me and she said that it's about lots of things, about adoption, about privilege and about all these things and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, sounds interesting. So I checked it out and I was shocked. Like it was so beautifully written, but it addressed so many important real life topics, but it addressed them in a way that was so well interwoven into the story that it didn't feel like someone was preaching at you or trying to teach you things. This was such an impactful and important story and I am so glad I read it. This book takes place in this neighborhood called Shaker Heights and it's this perfectly planned neighborhood and Everyone there follows the rules of this neighborhood and everything is very well organized. Nobody embodies the spirit of Shaker Heights more than this woman named Elena Richardson who lives there. She has a husband, four kids, a perfect house, and she is kind of privileged in every way. And then a woman named Mia and her daughter Pearl come to Shaker Heights and they rent out this... I guess a suite from Elena. They are as different from the Richardsons as they could possibly be. They are not that well off. They move from place to place and they're just 
not a very conventional family, so to speak. And then some old family friends try to adopt a Chinese American baby and they are white and the baby's mother is also trying to fight for custody of her baby. Mia and Elena are on opposite sides of this conflict because Mia is friends with that baby's biological mother and Elena is friends with the people who are trying to adopt this baby. All of the characters in this book feel so real that it's unbelievable. It's really hard to root for one person because I feel like all the people are doing the things they're doing because they believe that it's the right thing to do but they are at odds with other people who have other outlooks on life and it's just so interesting. I highly recommend you guys read this book. There's also a TV show based on this book, I think. I haven't watched it, but let me know if you have and whether it's worth checking out. The next book I'll talk about is also a five-star read, A Pinch of Magic by Michelle Harrison. This book follows three sisters, the Wittishan sisters, who have a curse placed upon their family. And this curse has been with their family for generations. And basically, this curse prevents them from leaving their hometown. If they leave, they will die. The middle sister is Betty and all she's ever wanted is to leave this hometown and go on adventures and do all these things. So when she finds out about this curse, she is obviously very heartbroken. So then she brings the three sisters together and sets off on a mission to find out more about this curse and to try and break it. I love the ending especially. Right up until the last couple chapters, I thought that this book would be a four star read but the ending just kind of bumped it up. What I love the most about this book is Betty and her determination to really succeed at what she's trying to do. I loved her and I loved the way that she really kind of went at it and did not take no for an answer. There were times when I was a little bit frustrated at how things ended up happening and how they ended up dealing with it, but then I had to pause and remind myself that they are children and that their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed yet and it's okay if sometimes they end up doing stuff like that. Overall, it was very magical and whimsical and the writing style was beautiful. I feel like the writing style and the plot wasn't really simplified to fit it into like a children's genre kind of. I feel like the writing and the plot itself was still very well developed. Sometimes when I read children's books and middle grade books, some of the plot points are a bit predictable and that was not the case with this book I found. There were genuinely things in this book that I did not expect, that I did not see coming at all. So this is another book that I also highly recommend. The next book I'll talk about is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. I also really like this book. Surprisingly, I ended up giving it four stars. This book follows the breakdown of our main character, Esther Greenwood. Esther is brilliant, beautiful, and successful, but she slowly finds herself going under. I was also very skeptical going into this book, first because I don't really enjoy classics that much, usually, and second because I don't go out of my way to read sad books that often. Esther talked about sad and depressing things in such a straightforward manner that I was quite shocked reading it. The writing style was beautiful and some of the metaphors and similes that Sylvia Plath used were so unusual that they really caught my attention. The way Esther thinks about life and about the world is very different and reading from her perspective in first person was quite a fascinating but also a scary experience. She has ways that she rationalized quite irrational things so it was quite shocking reading that from her perspective and then having to sit there and think about the fact that wait a minute that maybe was not the best thing to do. Overall it was well written and powerful and I'm glad I read it. I also read this book for a vlog where I read all of Connor's favorite books so also check that vlog out because I talk more about it than I did here. The next book is The Obelisk Gate. This is book two after the fifth season. I loved the fifth season so, so much. It was so amazing and I have nothing bad to say about it at all. I loved all of the main characters and the perspectives were so amazing and I loved it so much. I knew that there was no way that the second book would be able to be better than the first, but I expected it to at least be as good as the first one was. Unfortunately, I did not like this book as much as I loved the first one. I don't want to say anything specific about the plot in this book in case anyone hasn't read the first one, 
but this book does take off right from where the first book ended. In the first book, she's constantly on the move and she's doing things, going places, but in this book, she is just in that one place. And I was not a big fan. I was not used to her character being so stationary and I did not enjoy it. We also get point of view chapters from Shafa the Guardian and Eason's daughter Nasun. And I also did not like their point of views at all. I don't like them as characters and I don't like what they were doing. So I just did not enjoy reading about them. We also have a couple point of view chapters from Jija, Eason's husband. <sighs> When I tell you I was infuriated, I <laughs> I hated Jija so much in the first book and having to read from his perspective just... <laughs> I was filled with rage and fury. The writing was still very amazing and interesting things are happening in this book but the interesting things are happening to Nasun and Shafa and Jija. And because I don't like those characters that much, I was not able to fully enjoy all of the interesting things that were happening in this book. I just did not like it as much as the fifth season. The next book I'll talk about is Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. I also read this book for the vlog alongside The Bell Jar and Rebecca. So honestly, just check that out. I hate to be super repetitive about the books that I read. This book follows a man named David and he has a fiance who is traveling and while she's away he has an affair with Giovanni. David is kind of a horrible main character not because he's having an affair with Giovanni but because he is so selfish and misogynistic and just horrible. There is nothing redeeming about him at all in my opinion but the writing was so beautiful and so sorrowful that I ended up liking this book despite how horrible the main character was. The ending was so heartbreaking honestly made me cry. I felt so bad for Giovanni throughout the entirety of this book and that ending just was the last what is it straw on top of a haystack? The last the last straw that broke the camel's back. I don't know if I would recommend this to anyone because I'm not sure if any of you will like it really. It's just one of those books that you have to read and see what you think of it yourself because it's not a book that I can guarantee you'll like, but you could love it. And yeah, it's honestly such a hard book to really gather my thoughts about, but I did like it and I'm glad that I read it. And the last book that I, <laughs> the last, <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm already falling apart at the thought of having to talk about this book. The Maidens. I was so excited about this book. It was all dark academia this and dark academia that. I saw it everywhere when it came out and the cover was beautiful. And when I see dark academia, I pick the book up. Where was the Dark Academia? That is what I would like to know. Forget Dark Academia, actually. This book is also classified as thriller. So let's talk about the fact that it's a thriller. Where was the thrill? <laughs> Where was the scariness? Where was the mystery? Where was the thrill? Let me give you a quick summary before I get into it. This book follows a psychotherapist named Mariana and her niece, Zoe, goes to Cambridge University. I think that's the university. And at the university, there is this professor named Edward Fosca who teaches Greek tragedy. There are a string of murders happening at Cambridge and Mariana is convinced that it is Edward Fosca who is the murderer. What I knew about the book before I got into it is that there was a Greek mythology aspect tied into it and that was the reason I was very excited about this book. When I think of Greek tragedy, I think of tragedy obviously but also drama and rage and passion and all these things and I went into this book expecting it to be dramatic and passionate and filled with rage and fury. When I say I was disappointed I mean that I fell like Icarus from the sky like my expectations had me up here and I started reading this book and I just went like 
<laughs> the writing was so dry and clinical and dispassionate that I felt like I was reading something that was a cross between a history paper and a psych textbook. I actually wanted to DNF this book so many times after I started reading it, but I stuck to it. I kept trying to convince myself that it would get better and it did not. First of all, I did not like Mariana at all. She was bland and irritating. What's her business? What's her business there? Like, yeah, her niece attends this school, but so do the nieces of probably like tons of other people. You don't see them trying to butt into a criminal investigation. And as a therapist, I thought she was extremely unprofessional. She basically used her title as a therapist to kind of talk to all these people. Basically, she forced people into group therapy and just was so irritating overall that I could not root for her. I just was not interested in a single thing she had to say. None of the men in this book were interesting at all. There were a couple people like Fred and Edward Fosca. They literally lingered in the shadows trying to be mysterious and it was so ridiculous that I could not take them seriously. I liked that this book tried to include Greek mythology into the story, but I honestly do not see the relevance of it. I mean, yes, they were connected, but they were connected on a very shallow level. I honestly think that if you take all these Greek aspects out of this book, the overall story would have remained the same. I also did not like the ending at all, but honestly, by the time I was at the ending, I was just so glad to be at the ending that I did not think much about the ending at all. Overall, this book was quite disappointing and I ended up giving it one star. I'm really sorry to all of the people who love The Maidens. Like, obviously, if you love it, then good for you. It just was not for me, so... I apologize. I'm sure there are lots of books out there that you hate and I love, so I hope you won't hold it against me for hating this book. That's all I really have to say today. If you have read any of these books, please let me know. And if you have a favorite book that you read this month, feel free to share that with me as well. Anyway, my name is Ishi. Thank you so much for spending time with me and I hope your day is as wonderful as you are.